Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. How many of you uh, enjoy a good war movie or documentaries about the military? Movies like yeah, We Were Soldiers, uh, Saving Private Ryan, uh, Band of Brothers, uh, Hacksaw Ridge. I, I, can't, I can't really say I enjoy <laughs> watching those movies because oftentimes they're really a hard watch, you know, because these guys are in such harrowing situations based really on, on true events, true stories. And you just walk away in awe of the acts of, of courage and valor and heroism. And, and you see the cost and the loss of life and, and the way that courage impacts the lives of so many others. I think we can all agree it's a fact of life that great things in the world are only accomplished through courage, through courage. You know, lots of people can talk a big game. We can have great intentions, but true courage requires action. How many of you think uh, of yourselves as naturally courageous people? Any, anybody out there consider themselves kind of a, a naturally courageous person? Yeah, not many hands. I, I thought I was pretty courageous up until about a year ago. Uh, one night, Meredith and I are in bed. It's about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and Meredith kind of nudges me, and she was like, I think I heard something downstairs. And, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of in a daze, and I was like, oh, it's, it's probably nothing. It's probably nothing. But then uh, a little bit later, no, I, I think I heard something downstairs. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay. At that point, she gets out of the bed, and she walks out of our bedroom door to kind of the top of our stairs. Our stairs go down, there's a landing, and then they go down into our first floor. And she's kind of up there looking down the stairs, and about that time, she told me she sees a shadow coming up the wall of those stairs, and so what does she do? She starts beating on the wall. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. And at this point, I, I, I jump up out of the bed. You know, I'm disheveled. I don't, even, I'm half, I don't even know what's going. I go running out to see what's going on. And down on that landing is poor Bryson with his head covered. Please, please don't hurt me. It's me. It's me. It's Bry Bryson is our son, by the way. And he is begging for his life that we're not going to shoot him or do whatever it is that we have decided we need to do. I thought I was courageous up until maybe that point in my life. I, I looked up just a few uh, quotes this week just on courage. The great John Wayne said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. Don't you like that one? By the way, Jordan said, you, you have to mention that wasn't his real name. Anybody know what his real name was? Marion. His name was Marion Robert Morrison. I'm glad he went with John Wayne. <laughs> Billy Graham said, courage is con sorry, contagious. Courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. Don't you like that? That's a, that's a great quote. Rollo May, who was a, a psychologist uh, in uh, the 1900s, early 1900s, he said, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it is conformity. That one, that one got me this week as I, as I really thought about that. The opposite is not cowardice, it's conformity. For most of us, I would say courage is something that we have to learn we have to develop, and we're going to see in Daniel chapter 3 today that actually courage is essential in our lives as believers, as followers of Christ. Why? Because we are in a spiritual battle. Whether we realize it or not, the stakes are huge. We are in a cosmic spiritual battle every single day of our lives. And just like in our military, we need followers of Christ, disciples with strength of character, full of honor and courage and commitment that are willing to follow him no matter what the cost. Especially 
when the heat is on. That's actually the title for our message today. Anybody remember that song from the 80s, The, the Heat is On from uh, Beverly Hills Cop? Anybody around in the early 80s? I think that was about, looked it up, that was about 1984. If you've never heard that, young people, go look it up. It's a great song. The Heat is On. So how can we confront life's challenges, the trials and tests and temptations with courage and faith, especially when the heat is on? In our lives, I've heard it said you're either coming out of a hard time, you're in the middle of a hard time, or you're about to go into a hard time. So, what do you do when you're in the middle of the fire? Let's look at one of the Bible's most famous stories of. Christian courage of faith being tested today. It's the story, I think we all know it well. We grew up hearing it in in Sunday school. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or for everyone who grew up with veggie tales, it's the story of Rack, Shack, and Benny. Do y'all remember that one? Yeah, with your kids? All right, so let's pick up in Daniel chapter 3, but before that, let's, let's briefly remember what was happening at the end of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 ended with Daniel interpreting King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and his dream was of this giant statue, and the head of this statue was made of gold, and Daniel explained to the king that that head of gold actually represented King Nebuchadnezzar. But the body was separated into different parts. The body was made of silver, then bronze, then iron and clay. And those different parts of this statue's body represented other earthly kingdoms that were going to come in and conquer his. But then a stone made without hands was going to come from heaven and smash that statue, destroy that statue, bust it up into a million pieces. And that stone, that rock, not made with human hands, we know is Jesus. And he's going to establish his kingdom that never ends. He's going to abolish all earthly kingdoms that have been set up in independence of him. And he's going to establish his own kingdom. So chapter 2 actually ends with Nebuchadnezzar responding in amazement in chapter 2, verse 47. He says, after Daniel gives him this interpretation, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. But here as chapter 3 opens, Nebuchadnezzar has constructed a 90-foot statue of himself. Gold, not just the head of gold. This thing is gold from top to bottom, requiring everyone to come and bow down to this golden statue of himself. So not only has he forgotten the lesson from the dream, he's made it worse. This is what you would call an ego trip of massive proportions. He has set himself up and his kingdom as the most important thing on earth. So let's pick up in Daniel chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, to, just for reference, how many of y'all have seen uh, the Christ the Redeemer down in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, that, that big statue of Christ? Let's, let's bring that up and let everybody see it. If, maybe if you've never seen it before, this is a, a statue of Christ that overlooks Rio, and you can see it from anywhere. That statue is 98 feet tall, and, and look how it, it almost dwarfs the landscape. It's so huge. Okay, let's, let's see the next one from a different perspective, even from, from the mountains, the city. So this statue that Nebuchadnezzar has erected in honor of himself is just a few feet smaller than this, 90 feet tall. He set it up on the plain of Dura in this outlying area so that it can accommodate this huge crowd that he's going to require to come and bow down. Verse 2, then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judge, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue 
that he had set up. So here's what we need to understand. In, in chapter 2, verse 49, we learn that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been uh, promoted. And now they are part of this group of people. They have become governors of the province of Babylon. They are administrators in charge of all of the affairs of the province of Babylon. So they're going to be included in this group of people. Verse 3, so all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. Now let's, let's pause there just for a minute. I want to mention again, the last time that all the nations had been together in one place was back in Genesis chapter 11. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. What happened in Genesis chapter 11? All of the nations and peoples and languages had gathered together in one place to construct a tower in honor of who? Themselves in independence from God called the Tower of Babel. But here in Daniel chapter 3, we have Nebuchadnezzar. A uh, usurper, someone who's trying to steal the throne that doesn't belong to him, attempting to bring the nations back together, united around his greatness and his throne. And here's the irony. He's doing it on the exact same spot as where the Tower of Babel had been. Verse 5. Hear the instructions. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, I was like, did, did Dr. Seuss write this little, this little, who knows what a zither, has anybody ever heard of a zither? Okay, good. Well, one person, I had to look it up. Apparently, it's, it's similar to something called a dulcimer, then I didn't know what a dulcimer was either. <laughs> but it's like this wooden stringed instrument that you can kind of, almost like a guitar with a lot, or a harp that's laying down with a lot of strings. That's all it is. A horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre. Harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. When you hear the sound of those instruments, you, you, you have to drop everything. It doesn't matter what you're doing and bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bow to the ground and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So it's not enough that he's king. He also wants to be God. Now, isn't that the oldest temptation in the book? Right? If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, what does Satan whisper into Eve's ear? If you, if you just take a bite of that forbidden fruit, what's going to happen? You'll become like God. It's the oldest temptation in the book. We're not exactly sure how many were there that day for, for this event. Some say in the thousands, the tens of thousands. Others say it, it, it could have been close to even a million people that were gathered together for this event. So just imagine that scene for a moment. A million people bowed down in worship before this massive 90-foot gold statue from head to toe. But then what's, what's that? There's, there's three guys that are still standing. Are, are, those, are those those Jewish exiles? Do, do they really have the gall to be standing at this moment? Everyone else is down on their faces, and there they are, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, awkwardly, maybe even nervously, standing all by themselves in this sea of people who are bowed down on their faces. I know what you're going to ask at this point, where's Daniel? Because that's what Karen asked me on Friday. And luckily, I asked that same question, and I read some commentaries to find out exactly where Daniel was. Daniel now serves in the king's royal court. He got an even higher promotion after interpreting the dream. So now he is a part of the king's royal court. So he may have been exempt from being out in the crowd. He could have been on stage or, like most people think, he 
was like a government, government official today. He was on official business traveling to another country as an, as an emissary, as an ambassador for King Nebuchadnezzar. So he wasn't there. But no matter what the case, what we need to understand was he wasn't there. These three guys are alone. This small discipleship group is without their leader, and they're going to have to face this test on their own. It doesn't take long for them to get ratted out. Were these other officials jealous when they see these guys standing, these foreigners who got the promotions that they wanted? Y'all know about office politics. Some of y'all, don't you? They go before the king in verse 9. They jump at this opportunity. Once again, there's that long live the king. Remember, they, they keep saying that over and over again. Then in verse 12, there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Now look what happens in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. Are we seeing a pattern with this guy? He needs some some anger management uh, classes. And he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. Get those guys in here. Now, if you think about it, really nothing has changed for us today In our Babylon, we've already explained, that's where we live and serve and work and go to school. In our Babylon, taking a stand, doing the right thing, is always going to make some people angry, isn't it? It's always going to make some people angry. You know, follow Jesus if that's your thing, but how dare you label someone else's choices as sin? You just, you just keep, keep, that, keep those thoughts and opinions to yourself. How dare you not bow down to my preferences and my truth? Bow down to my, my preferences. And if you don't, we're going to come after you. Culture will punish you. It may not be throwing you into a fiery furnace, but you'll be canceled. You, you'll lose your livelihood. You, you could lose your job. Businesses will boycott you or sue you or mock and belittle you. What kind of backwards person are you believing that there's only one way to God, one way for salvation, only one source of authority? What kind of backwards person are you? A few years ago, the dean at Stanford University forced a group of Christian students to stop witnessing to others on campus. He said, you're fine to be Christians and to gather together weekly to worship, but you are not allowed to try to convince others that they can only be saved through Jesus. That's that's right here. We've said it's coming It's been in other places up to this point, but it's coming right here to our doorstep. And how are we going to respond when it does? You you must bow down to the statue of pluralism, right? Every road, every road leads to heaven. We're all going up the same mountain to the same God, just on different paths. You must bow to the statue of relativism. Everybody has their own truth. Your truth, my truth, and we all need to just respect each other's truth and bow down to that. Worship your Jesus, but then bow when you need to bow. When they were brought in, verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we've given you these names, these new names. What are you doing? That you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I tell you what, I'm, I'm feeling generous today. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. 
And then what God, little g, will be able to rescue you from my power. Do what I say or you're fired. Or more like you're fired literally. Right? Get on board or get barbecued. And while on the surface it might look like this is a choice between life and death, on the surface, on a deeper level, it's a choice of who are they going to obey? Who are they, who are they going to obey? God or this earthly king? Are they going to follow God or not, even when their lives are on the line? I love how these three young men respond. Here's their answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We have no need to answer you in this matter. That's a bold statement. We we have no need to answer you. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to think about it. We don't need to set up a poll on Facebook. what What should I do? What should we do? Give us your opinions. Our minds are already made up. There's only one thing to do, and they had a predetermined plan, and it was obedience to God, period. Obedience to God. We're going to be obedient no matter what. See, their faith wasn't private. You, You just keep your faith to yourself. Their faith was their life. This this is our life. This is the God that we serve. We're not going to shrink back just because we're being threatened. This is our faith. This is our life. This is not a private matter. How many of us have have said that? You know, I I just, it's private. I I just keep my thoughts and, and my relationship between me and God. It doesn't work that way. He's called you to be salt and light in this dark world. How is the world ever going to see who he is if we don't take a stand? Here's what they say in verse 17. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve. Now, notice that. Not who we, we can talk a lot about, that we come and we learn a bunch of facts about. These guys are serving the one true God. Our God whom we serve, is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. What had they just seen the chapter earlier? Their life was on the line in chapter 2, and they had this prayer meeting. They're begging, they're pleading with God, have mercy on us, save our lives from sure death, and God shows up. So they know who God is. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But, verse 18, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. Wow. That is bold and courageous face. Think about it. Everyone's bowing, and they could have just said to each other, all right, just bow down, pretend you're worshiping, but, you know, in our hearts and our minds, we'll be singing, great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord, right? We, We believe in the one true God. We'll just fake it. Or they could say, you know, just worship the idol, and then tomorrow, I'll wake up with a lot of guilt, and I'll do what I've done before. And, and, or am I hitting home with anybody out there? I'll just ask God to forgive me. It, I mean, won't he just do that? I'll just, I'll go ahead, compromise, do something I know I shouldn't do. Yeah, I'll feel guilty, but I'll just ask him afterwards to forgive me. How many times do we do that? Maybe I should just compromise this one time. These guys didn't do that. They had resolved in their hearts. They had made the decision beforehand. We are going to honor and serve and obey our God and our God only. We're not going to follow what everybody else is doing. I promise you, if you're a follower of Christ and you're truly, 
trying to follow after his call for your life? Satan, your spiritual enemy in this spiritual battle that we're all in, will give you ample opportunity in this world, even today, to compromise what you know to be true. And what you know to be his purposes for you. You're going to have opportunities even today to compromise. See, we don't have to have 90-foot statues. There are plenty of idols and images that the world wants you to bow down and worship today. Remember the big three that we talked about, money, sex, and power. Right? Those are, how do we look different in those three areas from the world around us? No, don't, you shouldn't look different. Bow down to them. Look around. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is. So just, just kneel, bend the knee, and bow. Bow down. I don't know if you realize this or not, but whatever is first place in your life is actually your God. We don't like to think of it that way. But whatever is first place in your life, that is your God. Listen to this definition. Any person, place, thing, or thought that becomes your source has now become your God. What are you looking to as your source for, for happiness, for fulfillment? What, what are you chasing after? That's your God. Wealth, success, beauty, pleasure, fame, influence, popularity. How about the temptation to build your own image like Nebuchadnezzar to create this false, filtered impression of yourself because you want to be loved. You want to be admired. You want to self-promote, dare I say, even worshipped. We see it everywhere, don't we? Especially on social media. It's, it's normalized. We even have image consultants today. right? You can hire somebody to help you with your image, to portray this image. Meanwhile, character, character, who you really are, has been replaced by image, what you want everyone to think you are. Ray sent a news story, story to me this week about a couple. Uh, this guy was a worship pastor um, somewhere, a very prominent church, and it was discovered that he's been doing a lot, of, a lot of shady things for a while now. But he and his wife have, together, they've written books. They have been on podcasts. They've led marriage conferences. And it's all been centered around this happy and healthy marriage. But that was just what was showing on the outside, the reality was a totally different story. And it had been going on for years and years and years. This double life, this secret life. The pressure to compromise never goes away. So what gave these young men confidence to speak so boldly, to take such a stance? We will never serve your gods, or worship the gold statue you've set up. The, think about it. The, uh, several commentaries said the fiery furnace probably was not that far away. It could have even been within their line of sight. They, they see what's waiting for them if they refuse what this king is asking them to do. They knew the price of taking a stand, and they did it anyway. How? How could they do that? This is actually applied Theology 101. See, it's different just to come and learn about who God is. We got to be willing to apply it in our lives, our faith and our trust. And that actually takes courage. This is applied theology, not just talking the talk, but practicing their faith. Did you hear what they said? In verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. They knew their God. They knew what 
he could do. God is able to save, able to rescue and deliver. And how did they know that? Because they had a foundation in their lives. They had an anchor. They remembered what he had done in the past, not just in chapter 2, but all the way back. They, they'd been hearing these stories ever since they were this tall as young Jewish children. This one true God spoke the universe into existence. He rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He fed his children for 40 years with bread from heaven in the wilderness. He provided water from a rock. He brought down the walls of Jericho. He gave his people the promised land. Time after time, he had defeated their enemies. They believed in a God that could do anything. Anything. He is able. And he can save us. He can rescue us. Because they knew what God had done in the past. They knew what he could do in the present. And this is where courage actually begins with this phrase, God is bigger. God is bigger. Jerry Howard has everybody wearing wristbands that says, God is big enough. God is big enough. That's the most basic principle of faith. God is bigger than your problems, any of whatever problem that you're facing today. He's bigger than cancer or a lost job. He's bigger than a broken marriage. He's bigger than your sin. He's bigger than your shame. He's bigger than the grave. All these things are real. I'm not downplaying what you're going through. But there's a God in heaven. Yes, you're going through what you're going through, but there is a God in heaven, and he's bigger. He's bigger. Maybe your bank account is really low, and you got to exercise some faith. God, you are willing, and you are able to be my provider. I know your name. Your name is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You have maybe a relationship that's absolutely falling apart. So, so what do you do? What do we do? What does our faith do in that situation? Our faith has to grow and say, I believe that God is willing and able to restore anything. Because his name is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. Faith believes that he can, expects that he will, but even if he doesn't. I love how Tony Evans explains that little phrase. He says, God is powerful so he's able, but he's sovereign, so he gets to choose. See, that needs to be a part of our theology. Because if all we have is he's able, then when he doesn't show up, what happens? We're disappointed, we're disillusioned, we get mad at God, we blame God, we point a finger at God. we got to remember, not only is he able, but he's also sovereign. He can see the big picture, so he gets to choose. See, these guys didn't know how this is going to turn out. We, we already know the end of the story, so we're like, oh, what's the big deal? These guys are in the middle of it. These guys are in the thick of it. They had no direct promise. They, they hadn't huddled up with God. God pulled them aside, let them know secretly, this is how it's all going to go down. That had not happened. They don't know what God is going to do, but their faith is unwavering. Because they know personally the goodness and the power and the heart of their God. Obedience, faithfulness, that's their responsibility. The outcome, that belongs to God. I'm just going to be faithful. I'm going to exercise my faith. I'm going to be obedient. And then I just have to trust God. You're sovereign. The outcome belongs to you. Which gives them the faith to say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we'd rather die in the flames with him than live in the palace with you. If that's what it comes down to, even if he doesn't, we'd rather die in the flames with him than bow down and live in the palace with you. To compromise, it's not worth it. 
what is, what, what's going to happen if we compromise? They not only believed that God was big enough to protect them, they believed that knowing him was better than anything they'd ever have to give up. Is that where you are today? Knowing him is better than anything that I might have to give up. See, here's the thing. Sometimes you take a stand and God delivers. And sometimes you take a stand and he lets you suffer. Just, just like his son Jesus. His son is begging him in the garden. If there's any other way, Father, please take this cup of suffering from me. And the father says, this is my plan. There's, I, I can't. But look at what happens on the other side of Jesus' obedience. Salvation for the world. For every single one of us in this room today is offered to you. Salvation, forgiveness of sins because of what Jesus went through. So the question you have to ask is, if he lets you go into the fire... Is he enough for you? Is he enough? That's exactly what's going to happen to these young men. God doesn't deliver them from the furnace. Let's pick up in verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with this response from these guys that his face became distorted with rage. Can't, can't you just see just, I remember Jerry just talking about the gnashing of teeth. Just, he is distorted with rage. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, why does he need to do that? Aren't they going to die in a normal furnace? So why is he saying seven times hotter? And then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, again, if they're being thrown into a fire, do they really need to be bound? What's the point? I mean, I mean they're going to die as soon as they hit the flames. So do you think that this guy, this king, was secretly worried that their God really is going to show up? I better make sure I do everything that I can do to make sure what they're saying doesn't happen. So they tied them up, verse 21, and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. Now think about it. Some of you who might grill sometimes. My, my fire that I've grilled steaks on has been so hot before that even to reach down to, to flip the steaks, I, I have to pull my hand away. It's that hot. And I've actually singed the hair on my hands just from a little Weber grill. Do, do we see what's happening here? This fire is so hot as these soldiers push these young men in. Just the heat coming out of the furnace kills these guys. It's that intense. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. Now, maybe you're asking the question, why would God put these young men in this position? I mean, they, they took a stand. They took a step. They exercised their faith. You, you, I mean, you've got to think that they expected God to, to save them, to deliver them, to rescue them, right? Did, did even one of them think as they were being led to the flames, oh, no. What have we done? What have we done? Where are you, God? I, I th we thought, I, I thought you loved me. If you're so good and powerful, why are you allowing this, God? How many of us have said those words? Have you ever been there? 
Why would God allow us to experience some of the challenges that we face in life? And this is a hard truth, and I don't like to say it today, but there are some character qualities that can only be developed in the fire, in the trials of life. And listen to me, I am not volunteering for that. I don't want to be there. None of us want to be there, but there are certain qualities that can only be developed in the fire. There are some things that can only be learned in the middle of the furnace. Listen to 1 Peter 1.7. Peter explains, this whole letter is about suffering. He says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. See, I'm, I'm doing something so important in your life by allowing these tests to happen. Now, here's what we can be sure of when the heat is on in our lives. Okay, I want to leave you with some hope. These are some takeaways. We can be sure when we walk through the fire, God will be with us. Okay, count on it, bank on it. God will walk with you through the fire. Over and over again, he's promised his presence no matter what you go through, if you'll trust him. He says, I I will be with you, I'll be with you, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth, to the end of time, I will be with you. So in Daniel 3, 24 and 25, they throw them in this fiery furnace and here's what happens. Suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, I want you to hear me today. This is not a son of the gods. This is the son of the one true God. And he's right there in the middle of this fire with these young men, with his servants who were exercising their faith. It's Jesus. Jesus was walking through the fire with them, and he promised to walk through the fire with you too. Listen to Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3. It says, when you, now notice it doesn't say if, it says when. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Some of you need to to write that verse down today. And you need to put it somewhere prominent in your home, on your refrigerator, in your car. You need to memorize it because it's a promise. It's a promise. Now, I wish that I could promise you that as you take your stand, you won't get fired. You won't face suffering or persecution or opposition. But I can't. I can't. If you read, and I encourage you to read in Hebrews chapter 11 this week, starting in about verse 35 to the end of that chapter. It doesn't, it doesn't have a happy ending for those at the end of the chapter. Even though at the beginning it's, it's this huge list, this amazing list of the heroes of the faith and how God rescued them and delivered them. But it doesn't always end up that way in the eyes of us as human beings. I can't tell you 
that he'll always deliver you. But what I am telling you, if you're walking through the fire today, you're not there by yourself. That if the living God doesn't bring you out of the fire, he's going to join you in it. Now, did you notice that word unbound in these verses that we just read? What happened? Here's a question for us. What happened to the ropes that were on their hands and feet that had them bound up? What do you think happened to those ropes? That, that Hebrew word means loosed or dissolved. That's, that's what that word literally means. Were the ropes potentially the only thing that the fire touched on these guys? Were, were they burned off? Were they loosed with a word from this fourth man in the fire or with just a touch? Whatever the case, they were liberated from what had them bound by Jesus. Now, why is that relevant? Because some of you are facing a fire right now, some big, some small, and you are begging God to deliver you from this suffering. You are begging God to end this season of challenge, to end this season of hurt or this season of trial. But could I propose that the very thing you want God to remove from you is the very thing God wants to use to set you free today? Tony Evans explains it this way. Sometimes when God wants to give you an encounter with him, sometimes he takes you out of it. Sometimes he saves you from the crisis. But other times he saves you through the crisis. He doesn't remove the problem, but he gives you the strength to handle it, and he's right there with you. But sometimes he saves us by the crisis. By the crisis. We've all heard the stories, haven't we? You know people who were headed in the exact opposite way of God. And then they went through bankruptcy or divorce or the loss of a loved one. And it got their attention and they came to Christ. They came to Christ. They had to hit rock bottom before they were willing and ready to look up. And Jesus meets them there. And they are liberated. They are set free in the fire. And how do they come out? They're not the same person because their character has been tested, refined, and purified in that fire. In prison, in the depths of depression, in the midst of suffering. I would venture to say that Logan Martin is not the same person today as he was before he went into the crucible. I think about the times in my own life. You know the times that I have grown the most, that I have grown in my faith, times that I have learned truly who God is. I have experienced him. He has revealed himself to me. Those have been the most darkest times of my life. They have. And I don't want to go back there, but that's where I've learned the most about who he is. In the fire. There's a purpose for us while we're there. God is burning off the stuff in your life that's actually holding you back. The impurities, the false beliefs, the habits, the pride, so that you can experience new freedom. New freedom. That's good news, I hope, for you today in a painful situation. So don't minimize what the presence of God in the circumstance of your hurt will accomplish. I love this quote I read this week. It says, sometimes God allows things we don't understand to accomplish something greater than we can imagine. He's working. He's working it all together for your good and for his glory. We got to keep that perspective. So back to our scene in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar sees these four men and he gets as close as he could physically to the fire And he says, servants of the most high God, come come out, come out here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. 
Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. How is that even possible? This is what's amazing. This whole scene foreshadows Jesus going to the cross for us. When Jesus was thrown into the fires of judgment with us, and because he did, we came through that judgment totally unharmed. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He took the flame so that we could emerge in safety with not a trace of judgment anywhere on our bodies, not even on our clothes. Only the ropes of bondage to our sin were removed, were loosed, were burned away. And what that means is this. If he went into the ultimate fires of judgment for you on the cross and he kept us totally safe and free from harm there, don't you think he'll keep you in whatever lesser fires that you're going into now? I promise you he will. The God who died for you in the fire is the God who can keep you in the fire. And so we conclude in verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's no other God who can rescue like this. See, when God shows up in your trial, in your hurt, the world's going to look on and God is going to be glorified. That's what's going to happen. The world is going to look at you, but they're going to see God. It's a witness. It's a testimony. They will say, praise be to the God of Emmet who was set free from addiction. Praise be to the God of Karen who stood by her husband when she didn't have to and God made their marriage better than new. When you stand in the midst of a battle, people looking on, they're going to see you, but they're going to give glory and honor to God. Because these guys stood when everybody else bowed, even though they got thrown into a fiery furnace for it, an entire empire got to see the reality of the one true God on display. So where are you feeling the heat today in your life? Is it financial pressure, job pressure, sexual pressure, peer pressure at school or at work, pressure to conform because everybody else is doing it? I want to challenge you to pass the test the way these three young men did in your own life. you gotta, you got to put your faith into practice. You have to show courage to stand tall in that situation. We, we have to determine we're going to do what's right no matter what the cost. We're going to obey God, period. Trust that God can use it for greater good so that others can see what God can do. Let me pray for you today.